Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Take a look. The sun going down in Baltimore. Police and protesters out in force. The breaking news tonight, less than a day after the city's mayor and police chief tried to get out in front of it, contain it, tamp it down. Protest over a man's death in police custody appears instead tonight to have grown. Marchers, who had been driven away last evening by rainy weather, came out today in force demanding answers to how Freddie Gray ended up with fatal spinal cord injuries after being arrested on the morning of the 12th. Mr. Gray's mother, overcome with emotion, collapsed during the march, could not go on. Her grief matched by a lot of other strong emotions tonight on the streets, including disbelief, mistrust, and obviously a lot of anger. We're going to speak in a moment with Baltimore's mayor and with our panel of experts about all the unanswered questions surrounding Freddie Gray's death. But first, let's go to Miguel Marquez with the protesters in the city of Baltimore. What's the latest? What's happening? Well, it's not entirely clear what is happening. They were just here at the West uh, District Police Office uh, where, where uh, Mr. Gray was meant to be brought. Uh, the uh, protesters have now moved to the, actually, they're moving to the intersection here, uh, and it's not clear why. There's uh, several hundred protesters out here at this point. Uh, throughout the afternoon, though, there, the, the numbers were as big as 2,000 people out here in these protests. They have been mainly peaceful, but moments of great, great anger, as we saw earlier, not directed at us. I mean, I think they're happy that the press is out here covering this, something that they say we've neglected too long, but they are extraordinarily happy. Uh, unhappy with the police and the mayor and the, and the city government here. What they want is all those six officers arrested on first-degree murder charges. They say they are going to take over the area around the city hall starting on Thursday, and they will stay there until there is justice. Anderson? Miguel, Gray's parents were there earlier. We said uh, the, that his mom collapsed. How did the crowd react when they showed up? It was, it was chaotic, but it was extraordinarily moving as soon as they showed up. Uh, the, the parents we had not seen so far, they, they, came, they came out, they came out and they, uh, were, and they were unable to talk for the most part because his mother was so overwhelmed with grief. They then marched from here to the police station where she didn't at one point want her family, uh, uh, her face uh, shown. When they got to the point where their son was arrested, though, they embraced they cried and they let out the, the, the longest, hardest wail that I have ever heard. It was extraordinarily hard to hear as everybody was quiet around them, their hands in the air. It was a very, very moving moment. Anderson? Miguel Marquez, thanks. We'll continue to check in with you throughout this hour. Now, Baltimore's mayor says that she is fighting to bring back trust between the police and the community. Stephanie Rawlings Blake joins us now. Madam Mayor, thanks very much for being with us. I know you are asking the same questions a lot of people are, namely, when and how was Freddie Gray fatally injured? At this point, have you really gotten any answers? Well, I want to thank the members of the public who have come forward to give us uh, video uh, evidence as well as uh, testimony because I'm determined to get to the bottom of it. We still have a lot of unanswered questions. What we know is that when the police first encountered Mr. Gray, he was able to talk. He was responsive. Uh, we saw him run. We saw him walk. We, we knew that um, you know, his, he did not look like he had any... Uh, physical injuries. What we also know is that very shortly uh, thereafter, when he was removed from uh, the, the van, uh, he was unresponsive. We know that he requested medical attention, and that attention wasn't um, immediately requested uh, for him. When, when did he uh, request medical attention? Know... I'm sorry, when did he request medical attention? When he was being put in the van? Uh, there were several points. There was at least one, uh, between one and three times that we uh, have documented that he's requested medical attention. There's one that we caught on the, the video where he's asking for an inhaler, uh, and there was another request for medical attention as documented uh, in the timeline that we published yesterday. So we know that there was at least one um, and, or, or more uh, times where he requested medical attention. Uh, and that's concerning. Uh, any human being um, that requests medical attention in a, in 
uh, a city as uh, that is known around the world for their for their um, you know their their medical expertise that we should be able to do better than that so that is a concern of mine and the concern of the police commissioner who has made it very clear in um, in reissued policies and procedures to the, the department uh, what they are to do when they have a, an individual in custody that requests medical attention when, when that he, person uh, yeah. will get medical attention immediately when he was in the back of the police vehicle was he there by himself do you know was there an officer present with him no, no officer present uh, by the t there was there were two stops made and by the second stop or the third there was an, an additional uh, uh, suspect placed in the van but n had no ability to uh, contact there were there are two separate sections of the van so the person was not in the same section as mr. Gray in, yesterday or, or several days ago I believe there was a statement I'm not sure if it was from you or somebody else in City Hall saying that it seemed that whatever happened to uh, mr. Gray happened after he was placed in custody once he was in the van but in the video it certainly seems like his legs are I, I don't know if you can say I don't want to use the word paralyzed but but he doesn't seem to be using his legs he's being dragged do you now right. believe that whatever happened to him occurred before he was put into the van I I said yesterday that I believe something happened while uh, they were in the van. That's based on what I can see and what I'm piecing together. I wasn't there. The police commissioner wasn't there, nor the deputy commissioner were there. Um, and what is most important, not necessarily what my conjecture is, but what is most important is that we get to the bottom of what happened. And that's why it's so important, as I started off, by saying that we have more people come forward with information. If we have any eyewitnesses that are out there, we want to hear from them. Um, I don't know at what point um, Mr. Gray uh, suffered the, the traumatic uh, and fatal injuries. I don't know, but I'm determined to get to the bottom of it. What have the police actually told you? Because my understanding is there's actually um, a cooling off period, so-called, where, where authorities are not actually even allowed to interview the police officers on the scene. Is that true? And if so, why is that? Because I think a lot of people would think, well, look, it's been more than eight or nine days, ten days. Why haven't, why isn't there a clear timeline, a clear, you know, blow by blow, for lack of a better, you know, term, uh, as to exactly what happened? So have the, all the police well, been interviewed? There is, there is a timeline uh, that we put out, and we're trying to use uh, police testimony as well as testimony from the public to support the timeline that's already um, been um, published by the. But, but you're department. saying you don't know what happened. Um, there is. You're saying you don't know exactly what happened. I mean, we're going now past a week. How can, at this point, you, the mayor of the town, not know exactly what happened? Have all the, have all the police officers given their full accounts? So I was getting to that, right? The, the officers who were, at, who were directly involved, um, because of our Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, uh, we have yet to fully uh, engage those officers, and we will get to the bottom of it. I'm determined to make sure that we have a full investigation and we follow all of the rules and procedures. So if there, was a fi there is a finding of wrongdoing, that we have done everything possible to protect, the, to protect policies and procedures so we can hold those individuals accountable. You know, I know that there's an interest and a frustration about the amount of information, but can you imagine the frustration if we screw this up? I want to make sure that we get, uh, and we're pushing out as much information as we have as soon right. as we're able to confirm it. And, and uh, there's but no, there's still some unanswered questions. Then there's no doubt about that. I mean, you have been very forthright with the information that, that you have. But again, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, certainly who are on the streets tonight, it, or, or, you know, when they hear about the, the officer's Bill of Rights, they're going to wonder why those officers get so long before they actually have to account for what happened. How long, according to this Bill of Rights in Baltimore, do officers have before they actually have to give an accounting? There are two time periods. There's a time period uh, to which they have to get an attorney, and there's a time period after that. And I'll say that, you know, I was in, an, I was in our state capitol fighting for stronger laws when it comes to, stronger reforms when it comes to the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. I was down there, one of a handful of elected officials that were fighting to give our police commissioner more tools to hold uh, officers accused of wrongdoing accountable. Um, you know, I, this, the, the, the fact that there uh, is a perception of an uneven playing field between the police and the community is not lost on me. And that's why I was fighting so hard. And I'm looking forward to having more support 
supporters down there fighting along with me mm. next session so we can get more of those um, better reforms in place and better tools in place so we can hold those officers accountable. You know, we've made a lot of progress uh, in, in Baltimore. Um, law, uh, lawsuits against the city, against the police department under my administration have gone down, discourtesy complaints, um, excessive use of force complaints are going down, but we have a lot of progress to do. And it significantly uh, hampers our uh, ability to, to uh, bridge the, uh, or to, to repair the relationship with the community and the police when something this tragic happens. That's why I'm determined to get it right. That's why I'm determined to work with um, anyone. Right. I know the Department of Justice uh, is going to be here uh, work uh, investigating. I want them to take a look at this. I want uh, to get it right for the community. Mr. Gray's family deserves justice and our community deserves an opportunity to heal to get better and to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. I, I just got two more questions for you. One, I want to ask you about the, the protesters outside, your concerns, your, your hopes for, for what you're going to see tonight. But, but, but first, I want to ask you, how concerned are you? I mean, the initial reports say that the police basically made eye contact with Mr. Gray and that he turned around and uh, started running away and that the police pursued him and then tackled him. Is that appropriate? Um, uh, there, there is an account, I believe, from a police officer saying somebody saw uh, a, a knife clipped to his, uh, the, the front of one of his pockets. Some people have raised questions about whether that could actually have been the case. But is simply not wanting to interact with the police cause for being stopped in Baltimore? So I'm an attorney by trade. I spent a significant amount of time while I was uh, serving as a member of the city council as a uh, defender in the pub, as an attorney with the public defender's office. I know what probable cause is. Um, I haven't heard a probable cause in this case yet. And those, that's one of the questions uh, that I want answered. I know uh, that uh, having a knife is not necessarily probable cause for a stop or an arrest. That's why I have significant questions about what happened, and that's why I'm determined to get to the bottom of it. You know, we are working very hard. I've spoken to the governor today uh, that controls the medical examiner's office um, and asked that, you know, please, as, as soon as you can release uh, concrete information about what you're seeing with the autopsy, please release it to the family and to the public so we can continue to pull out, to put out as much information as possible while we are conducting this investigation. I want to make sure that, uh, that we get this right, that we continue to put out as much information as possible, and that, um, again, like, I'm determined that something like this not happen again in our city. And, and to the protesters tonight, what do you want them to know? Uh, that I hear them, that I share their frustration. I haven't heard uh, what the probable cause was. I haven't heard uh, the cause of this fatal, uh, very serious fatal injury. Um, I share your concerns. I grew up in Baltimore. I know our history, and that's why I've worked so hard uh, in my career, in, in my time in public service, trying to, to make things better uh, in Baltimore. It's clear that we have uh, more work to do. We also, we also have a history, however, of peaceful protests, respectful protests, and I will work. The police department is committed, and I've instructed them to work to make sure that the voices of the community are heard. Uh, they deserve to be heard. They have a right to be heard, and we will make sure that we protect that right. Madam Mayor, uh, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. When we come back, we're going to tackle some of the answered questions that we've just been talking about, and the unanswered one. As always, make sure you set your DVR. You can watch 360 whenever you want. Coming up later tonight in this hour, some major new developments, also in the showdown with Iran in the waters off Yemen, and President Obama weighing in.